if you don't play by the rules. There are three, I'm gonna give you the three rules, three laws of mastery, okay? You're not gonna get better at stuff unless you understand these three rules, the three laws of mastery. The three laws of mastery. Number one, mastery is a mindset. Mastery is a mindset. This comes from the work of a psychologist named Carol Dweck, who's done some incredibly brilliant research, mostly, you know, particularly on, on children, that, that, that says essentially this. You can have, what she says, you can have a growth, you can, you can think, think about your intelligence, okay? You can say that, we can think of intelligence as something that is either fixed, that is, everybody has a fixed supply of intelligence, and that's the way that it is, or it's something that you can grow. Your decision about what that is radically determines how you behave. So if you have a fixed notion of intelligence, if you say intelligence is fixed, I have this much intelligence and that's the ball game. What happens, especially among kids? Don't try as hard. Hey, do take easier things. I don't want to be shown to be stupid. But if you have a growth theory, if you say intelligence is like a muscle that can be grown, you do more challenging things and you actually grow that intelligence. So you have to believe that things can grow. Mastery is a mindset. You have to believe that your talents are not fixed. That is, your, that is, your capabilities are not just fixed and they're kind of imprinted on your DNA, but they're things that you can actually grow. If you don't believe that, then you're not going to achieve mastery. Number two, mastery is a pain. Mastery is a pain. Getting better at something is really, really hard. It's really, really hard. It sometimes hurts. It sometimes hurts a lot. It takes a really long time. Think about those, I mean, all of you are in sales. Think about how long it takes to get good at sales. It takes a really long time, and it, there's some painful moments along the way. And one of the things that's interesting here is that what matters more often than carrots and sticks in, in summoning one's inner drive is this right here, this concept right here, grit, which is a concept in social psychology that's defined like this. Perseverance and passion for long-term goals. I'll give you one interesting study of this. There was this uh, think about West Point, okay? West Point, very difficult to get into the United States Military Academy. But when you get into the United States Military Academy, unlike other colleges and universities, you don't immediately start in the fall. You start in the summer with this kind of basic training called Beast Barracks. Beast Barracks. Very tough, very demanding basic training. And West Point noticed that basically 10% of every incoming class was washing out. They couldn't even make it through Beast Barracks, couldn't even get to the classroom that first day of fall. We're really puzzled by that. It's a huge waste of money, huge waste of talent. Why were some people washing out? What were the things that were determining that? So they started looking at other variables. Was it, were maybe people who were athletes were less likely to wash out. Maybe people who were from military families were less likely to wash out. Maybe people with higher SAT scores were less likely to wash out. Maybe people who had leadership roles in high school were less likely to wash out. They check all of these criteria. It turns out that only one, there's only one predictor, which is this level of grit. Grit. Their capacity for perseverance and passion over long term for long term goals. That is, in some ways, the best predictor of performance. And it's something to keep in mind when you feel like, oh man, I'm not making progress. What you have to realize is that people who make progress are persevering and, passion, and, and have passion for the long for long term goals. Let's go to number three. We know that mastery is a mindset. We know that mastery is a pain. Rule number three: mastery is an asymptote. Which, of course, raises the question. What's an asymptote? Yeah. And for those of you who've forgotten your high school algebra, I will show you. Here's a picture. See that line that there, y equals three? That's the asymptote. All right. And that other line, that blue line, can come close and 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 close, but never gets there. And that's the nature of mastery. All of us want to get better at stuff, but we're never going to get perfect. And that's both simultaneously alluring and irritating. And that's why we keep at it. So if you remember those things, that the nature of progress, of making, making progress is the single most motivating thing at work. But in order to make progress, you have to have a belief in your ability to make progress. You have to recognize that making progress is difficult. And you also have to recognize that making progress is an asymptote. That you'll get close, but you're never going to get perfect. Now, how do we get better at this? How do we get better at this? Mastery depends in large part on feedback. Mastery depends in large part on feedback. And in large companies, the way that we give people feedback is through annual performance reviews. Now, I'm glad to admit that I just heard some laughter. I'm glad you're laughing at annual performance reviews. 
as a form, as a way of giving people feedback, they're laughable. They really are. What's wrong with an annual performance review as a way of giving people feedback? They're annual. Thank you, class. Think about how idiotic that is. I mean, many of you, again, have, have left large organizations or never worked at a large organizations, so you, have, you don't have to be subject to this idiocy. But think about how idiotic that is as a way to get better. Let's take a great tennis player, Rafael Nadal. All right? Rafael Nadal. Rafael Nadal has a job, like you and I have a job. His job happens to be hitting tennis balls back and forth across the net very, very hard. Imagine if Rafael Nadal got feedback on his tennis once a year in an awkward 45 minute meeting with his boss. <laughs> he wouldn't be very good at tennis, right? All of you know that, all of you who are on your own know that, so what we have to do is we have to sort of enrich that feedback. And I think, again, sort of like the stop doing list, sort of like the to don't list from Peters and Collins, I think we need something like this, which is we should all be doing our own performance reviews. We should be doing our own performance reviews. And here's how it works. At the beginning of the month, set out your goals. Not only your performance goals, not only how many calls you, I think that's good, not only how many calls you want to make or how many leads you want to generate, but also what do you want to learn? What do you want to accomplish? What do you want to contribute? And at the end of the month, call yourself into the office. <laughs> Give yourself an evaluation. Where are you making progress? Where are you falling behind? Now it turns out that people who work in teams, and many of you have this very interesting relationships of working with other folks in the industry and so forth. That high performing teams always do this. They do it without the boss asking, they do it without the boss knowing. And I think you should be doing this yourself. I think all of us should be doing this. Setting out our goals, giving each other feedback. That's what great athletes do, that's what great musicians do. They don't outsource that feedback to somebody else. They set up mechanisms to generate it on their own. They often do it with peers. Small entrepreneurs have been doing this since Ben Franklin's day. Meeting, setting up their goals, giving each other feedback. And I think that's how we can make progress, by getting that rapid, rapid feedback. Let's go to the final one. Autonomy, mastery, and last, and certainly not least, is purpose. Now this is something that I think you'll find very close to Keller Williams' heart. And I think that you'll find what Keller Williams is doing, the ethic that Keller Williams is, is inculcating here, is very, very consistent with the science. Let me give you one interesting study of this. I think you'll find this interesting because it's a, um, it's, it's basically a, a pretty much a direct study of sales performance. And here's how it worked. It was a study of another call center. But this is a call center at the University of Michigan where people were making outgoing calls to try to raise money. Now all of us you know, who went to college know that after paying a lot of money or going into debt to, to college, upon graduating, you're regularly asked for more money. And so this University of Michigan call center was designed to do that. The people on the phone calling saying, hey, you love the maize and gold, can, I, can you contribute $50 or $100? Maize and blue, right, maize is gold, right. See, I'm from Columbus, Ohio, so I, you know, I have a hard time processing anything from Ann Arbor. <laughs> the May, so, they divided these callers into three groups, okay, each night before they made calls to raise money, which is obviously a sales function, all right? The first group, each night before they made calls, we left them alone. That's our control group. The second group, each night before they made calls, they read stories for five minutes of people who had previously worked in that call center, writing about what they learned working there. That, hey, I worked in this call center raising money, and I actually learned something. I learned how to deal with rejection. I learned communication skills. I learned negotiation skills. I learned how to talk to diverse groups of people. Five minutes before going to making these sales calls, they reminded themselves of the personal benefit of working there. The third group also read stories for five minutes before hitting the phones, but these were different kinds of stories. They were stories from people who had received funds that were raised there. My name is Joe Schmatz, and I couldn't afford to go to college, but because of the scholarship funds raised here, I was able to go to college, and now I'm a pediatrician. My name is Maria Lopez, and I um, work in a laboratory at the University of Michigan uh, doing research on breast cancer that was funded by this kind of work. Okay, so we had one group, our control group, just normal. This group reminded for five minutes of the purpose of, of uh, the benefit of doing what they're doing, the personal benefit, this group reminded of the purpose. And of course, the people were told, don't discuss the contents of what you've read with the people you're calling. They look at the results. This is some interesting, if you're, if you're interested in this line of research, the scholar who's doing this, his name is Adam Grant at the University of Pennsylvania. Some amazing, amazing work here. Um, the people in this third group, the